<laughs> Writing about the Forest of Dean, though, that's something you've done with your debut book, Shelter. Um, prior to that, though, you've lived in America, you've also written for The Guardian. So how did you come to, to this point, then, in time? So this is, um, this is where I start to rant. Um, but I knew that I wanted to write a novel and I was sort of flittering around not quite sure what it was going to be about and then in 2011 as you'll all know um, the Tories tried to sell the forest off and I just got really worked I mean I know we probably all did I was just so worked up about it we were back in the UK by then and I couldn't believe that some other I'd sort of just taken for granted as you know almost belonging to the people was a commodity that could be sold like that um, and so I basically pitched to the Guardian that I should write about what it was like to grow up here and you know what it would mean if something like that was sort of fenced off and as a consequence of that um, I was still sort of angry I finished it and it was a you know I got a lovely response but I was still furious about it and I thought well maybe this is my forest book you know maybe this is my novel and then I thought nobody wants to read you know an entire book's worth of me ranting about David Cameron um, <laughs> and I will go mad if I try to write that so I thought back to a time where you know I thought when else has the forest been so under threat by sort of well-meaning government officials who have no idea really what they're dealing with and so the second world war was the time that you know really came to mind then. And so the Second World War, a period of time that many of us we know a huge amount about, but you've chosen two characters in your book, Connie and Seppe, who, Connie's a lumberjill and Seppe is a uh, prisoner of war from Italy. Was it important for you to maybe tell a different kind of story, one that you thought hadn't been told before? Yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, um, I was basically obsessed by Goodnight Mr Tom. Um, I don't know if anybody's read that children's book, but it's set in, I want to say, Dorset, certainly sort of somewhere in the West Country and it was, I completely identified with it um, because it was a, you know, it was a war story that wasn't the Blitz and wasn't the Holocaust and all the other stories and um, as an adult I still really loved books um, set in the Second World War but really wanted to tell those stories that, you know, we don't perhaps know so much about, that, you know, aren't sort of plucky factory workers and, you know, meeting GIs and all the rest of it. So, and because I came at it from the point of view of the forest, then that already, to a degree, um, decided what the story was more likely to be about. And the Forest of Dean itself, it feels like in reading the book, is a character in its own right, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of, you know, I say it's sort of my centre of gravity for the book, is where I started from, and so getting the forest right was really important to me. Um, I swapped work with a, another novelist friend, and she said to me at one point, can't believe you found still more ways to describe trees. <laughs> I've got so many more ways to describe trees you haven't even started yet. <laughs> and one thing I love about the book is every time you're turning the page you want to know what's happening with the characters, you want to know what's going to happen next. It felt to me almost like the, the kind of the layers of, of bark on a tree in that respect <laughs> because there's so many secrets, there's so many different things that kind of come out. I mean, was that quite important for you to kind of keep the story going that there's always something you're wondering, why is this happening? What, you know, what's going to happen next with this particular character? Yeah, and I think it didn't start off like that. You know, there was lots of, you know, I'd write it and then read it and go, this isn't working at all and we need to know more about this. And then, you know, do you tell it chronologically or does that get quite dull? And because I decided to keep it quite tight, you know, I think originally at one point it went from 1942 to 1948 and I was like, who wants to read six years worth of stuff? And so having compressed it, then sort of folding in the backstory a sort of loops became a way of you know making it more than just and then they woke up and cut down some more trees you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you did a lot of your research didn't you at the Dean Heritage Centre? I did yeah they were so helpful down there and they've got really really interesting things in the archives they've got um, photos of lumberjills and of the prisoners of war and um, just sort of really interesting artifacts and some um, the, I think it, I think it was the BBC that started it actually but uh, the sort of people have been encouraged to write down their memories of these things so they've got um, almost sort of like war diaries from the lumberjills um, that they granted me access to as well which is amazing. How much did you know about this period of history before you started researching the book? So I knew about the Second World War generally just from having or always like reading about it um, and because I'm a colossal nerd I did my O-level history project like sort of you know 30 years ago or something <coughs> on the Second World War or the home front in the Second World War and because 
I lived here, the, I, I asked people questions, you know, I, I sent out a questionnaire and in the 80s there were loads of people for whom, you know, the war had only finished 40 or 35, 40 years ago and so there were loads of people who had really strong memories of the Second World War and when I came to writing this I dug basically my, you know, 16 year old self's homework out and the questionnaires were amazing actually in terms of sort of verbatim starting points. Now you've brought along some props, haven't have. you, here? And as, um, in part of the book, um, Seppe, one of the characters, he's uh, he's a carpenter, but he also does <coughs> um, he does a lot of, a lot of wickling, doesn't he? he does. And he does create uh, a ring in in the book. And you've brought these along, and these are yeah. from your grandmother. These are yeah. So these I can pass them around if you like. Um, <coughs> my grandmother, when I was doing the history project. Um, dug them out for me and she used to take in sewing and in ways that I don't sort of quite really understand had taken sewing in for the prisoners um, because they were granted so much sort of freedom to wander around and they as a way of um, repaying her I think had made these rings and we think they must be melted down from tin they're really light mm. so I think it's interesting mm. to hold them because they're just yeah. surprisingly light and so we've been trying to work out what they could have been made and where on earth they got the little stones from but they're just so beautifully etched that you know when it came time for Seppe to be creating one I, I had these rings I thought if anybody says that's not plausible how could a prisoner make a ring I'd be like no no look mm. <laughs> here they are you know? and then this here this is a, a little a token if you can see that yeah. what's this then Sarah how does it fit in so that that into, like, um, so that's a the, the prisoners of war and this was the same all over the UK um, and actually prison of war camps were uh, what's what I want sort of safeguarded by the Geneva Convention so prisoners had to, prisoners of war had to be treated the same wherever in the world they were which is quite smart I think it's like well we've got yours and we're keeping them safe so you know you better look after mm. ours um, they weren't allowed real money in case they you know amassed it and used it when they were ready to escape um, fundamentally and so they were paid with um, little plastic sort of fake well, like monopoly money almost mm. um, and Honestly, I can't remember how I got a hold of that. I assume my grandmother was also somewhat randomly given this, you know, fundamentally pe useless piece of currency and thankfully for me, held on to it. And did your grandmother talk very much about that time in history to you? Not tons. I mean, I was a kid that always asked 9,000 questions, so she probably, you know, just fielded the questions and that's how I remembered it. Um, and certainly when I came to do my project on it, she must have been in her... 30s then and so she has very strong memories of it they had evacuees staying with them you know so in that respect it was a really sort of I mean I always say it's sort of if we were to remember now 30 odd years back it's banana rama you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's not nearly as interesting as what people were living through there but it, but it's not that far back you know we could remember we could all talk for years about banana rama but let's not you know so <laughs> so you know it was an easy thing I think for people to talk about and the characters in the book, they're, they're all fictional, aren't they? Although you were saying to me, your dad makes a cameo <laughs> yeah, in it. Bless him, yeah. He didn't. So my dad was 10 when the war ended. And I just thought, um, quite near the finishing of the book, you know, he told these stories about how he used to sort of um, hang on to the back of the baker's van to kind of get on his bike to get pulled up the hill. And they'd go into the camps um, and then sort of come back out. And so I wrote it in as a scene and he was just completely unimpressed, you know? <laughs> which is fine. You know? But I just thought for my own sake, you know, I'd sort of drop him in as a cameo. Uh, Connie, who's the central female character in the book, very strong woman. How important was that for you to sort of have that kind of character centrally in the book? So she was always the centre of the book. Um, but initially she was just quite wishy-washy. She was a bit overwhelmed by, you know, the forest because it was so different from Coventry where she'd come from and she was overwhelmed by, you know, her sort of general circumstances and she wasn't working. It was just all a bit like, oh God, who wants to read about her? She's so trippy. <laughs> and then, and somebody read it and went, why are you writing, like, why are you writing something like this? This makes no sense. And um, I was like, yeah, no, you're right. So I just made her more empowered and I think you know, in the Second World War, it's, you know, quite well documented. It was a time of enormous empowerment for women and the sort of freedom to explore new ways of working, new ways of living. You know, someone like that would not otherwise have, you know, gone from a, a sort of factory situation in Coventry, wouldn't have travelled as far as the forest. You know, she doesn't even know it exists. And so I thought, actually, why not write someone who's just really open to all this change and sort of seeing what life would bring her? 
And in doing your research, how welcoming did you find that people in the Forest of Dean were at that time, to people like Connie or, or specifically people like Seppe? People were really welcome and I think there's a sort of sometimes a perception that, you know, for us to stay close and guard their own and all the rest of it. But actually at that time you know, there were so many changes foisted upon people um, with, you know, evacuees, GIs, the German and the Italian prisoners, all the land girls, the lumberjills, you know, all these new people. And I think the fact that so many people stayed on after the war sort of speaks for the warmth that they found when they came. Your two main characters that you're kind of you know, you're giving us the perspective of, they're very much outsiders coming into the forest. I mean, how much did you want to kind of get that sort of the view of the forest taken from somebody who isn't from here? I think I really say so I absolutely wanted to sort of make the point that, you know, how that would look. And so Connie's quite sort of city oriented. And so she just finds it all completely bonkers. And Seppe, although he was from an Italian city, just really welcomes the peace and you know, sort of the rhythms of the work. And so I wanted to show multiple viewpoints from an outsider's perspective. And then Amos, who's the old sheep badger who Connie ends up um, living with, you know, I wanted him to sort of be, this is how it is, and for him to have the sort of perspective of other people, which he would never have had before. Everybody would have thought about it the way he did, which is to say probably not thought about it very much. Mm. And, and in reading the book, there's obviously references to real places, although the people are fictional. Connie, at one point in the book, she wants to find out how long it's going to take her to get to Cinderford to get on the train and that kind of thing. I imagine that was important for you to put those kind of those real markers so that, again, it was very much rooted right here in the forest. Yeah, and especially because I came at it from a perspective of they're trying to sell this thing, how dare they, sort of thing. But I really wanted to sort of, in my own tiny way, sort of represent the forest and stand up for it and say, look, these are real places. Um, and the people that I have invented are, you know, are fictional, but the places aren't, even though, and especially if I'm talking to an audience that knows the forest, well, I always have to apologise because the place, I always say the topography is right, like the places are right, but the geography isn't, like I've moved places together and I'm here. So, so people have been looking at, when I gave it to my dad to read, uh, he, was, he was my kind of staunchest critic in a way, he kind of, he noticed that I had bluebells in somewhere in January and he's like, what? And I thought, oh God, I changed the month and I forgot to change it. <laughs> and also you never get from there to there. And I was like, I know. So I, lit, I have put a note at the back that basically apologises to all foresters. But I've represented, I hope, the place um, accurately in one sense and just taken complete liberty with it in another. <laughs> How, what was the process like for you writing the book? This is this is your first novel. You'd come obviously from being a journalist, which is a, a very different type of writing. I mean, how did you kind of find the process compared? I found that I had to set myself deadlines, but that was okay because life is quite you know my life's quite sort of choppy, and so putting deadlines and going right, I've got half an hour to write something now. You know, I'm going to write 300 words. I could do that. It was much less daunting than trying to write. I think this is a hundred thousand words in the end. So. <laughs> I think it's much easier to write 300 words than it is to write, you know, 100,000. And so being used to writing 1,000 words by Tuesday made that much easier, I think, in some respects. And, of course, you're used to writing facts. This is, this, you know, is a work of fiction, isn't it? So I guess yeah. you need a lot more creative. Yeah, although that, um, that was tricky at the beginning. I sort of wrote one draft and then gave it to someone to read who said it reads like non-fiction and that wasn't a compliment necessarily. <laughs> it's like, what have you done? You've taken all the fiction out of your fiction. Oh, and I think especially because I was, you know, because the forest is real and what happened in terms of the um, timber core was, was real, then I'd kind of almost flattened the characters into non-fiction just almost instinctively. So I had to learn to kind of move it back up a bit. And this was a project that you lived with for quite a few years, wasn't it? And your family lived with as I well. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They're very long-suffering. They all know far too much and they all want to know about trees at this point. <laughs> was there ever, ever a point in the book where you thought, I'm not quite sure where, what's going to happen next? Did you ever get kind of stuck at any point? I wrote it and rewrote it about, I'd say probably six or seven times. You know, and I'd read it and think, oh, that doesn't work. This bit's missing. You know, give it to somebody else to read and they'd have questions that were, you know, the answers were all in my head and none of them on the paper or sometimes they weren't in my head either <laughs> we'd have to kind of sit and puzzle how something might happen and I've got um, so the novelist friend that I swapped with her big thing was always I don't believe this you know so she'd read it and she and she isn't from the forest so she'd just say I don't believe this can happen and and even my editor 
when it went, you know, when it was um, sold and I worked with the editor at the publishing house, she took a lot of persuading that the Italians had as much freedom as I'd given them. And I was like, no, look, they really had to kind of show her source material to get her to believe it. So all sorts of different stuff. Yeah, that's something that really struck me reading the book. I, I thought, did they really have this much freedom? But, but talking to John Belcher earlier on today at the Dean Heritage Centre, he was saying that actually, yes, they, they did and, and could sort of wander with, with relative freedom. Yeah, I mean, they still had curfews and so on and they were in uniform. Um, but because they were, I think, and they weren't all, so there were sort of various gradings of them if they had a black armband it basically meant that they were you know very much considered still to be an enemy you know then they weren't allowed out in case they tried to spread propaganda but for the most part they were a really useful resource especially in the forest you know so they were used on the land and also you know in the timber work and of course many as you said did actually yeah. stay here after the after the war ended yeah exactly sort of married locals you know all these things that weren't supposed to be going on <laughs> <laughs> that was all based in fact so mm. You know, and I just, I sort of like that about it, really. What was it like writing the book almost from a bit of a distance? Because you live in Oxfordshire now, and you presume you writing the book at home a lot of the time. What was it like kind of writing about the forest, but not actually being here? So before I was sort of really able to sum the book up properly, if people asked what I was writing about, I'd say I was writing about trees and homesickness. Because that was kind of what it was, you know, that was what it was about. And it was just, it was a lovely way to be here when I wasn't here writing the book that sounds kind of cheesy but <laughs> <laughs> and what about influences are you influenced at all by any other writers from the forest of dean because it, you know it does have a rich history as, as reading the forest is, is showing us i suppose not i can't there's no harry potter in it there are no wizards <laughs> <laughs> um dennis Fosser, who i know jason is a an expert on um i think isn't obviously through the book but the way he writes about the forest definitely had an impact and Growing up, you know, there wasn't really anybody else who was, you know, Winifred Foley was doing some, but she sort of came to mind later. I read, um, when I was writing this, I read lots of Joyce Latham stuff because she wrote about this period and she was about the right age, so that was kind of useful. Um, but, yeah, it was sort of, as much as anything, I was like, I wish there were more books that I could have read at that sort of age. And do, have you felt homesick at different points then for the forest, particularly if you lived in, lived in America for a while? Yeah, I'm just, I'm chronically homesick, you know, I'm just, it's tragic, I've kind of, it's a, a state of, of life at this point, I think, you know, I think it's feasible to be homesick for sort of more than one place at more than one time, <laughs> so, yeah. And you regularly come back to the forest, don't oh, you? Oh yeah, so I mean, we're finally. back again next week, so I'm, you know, I'm here today and then I'm back next week, so I get back down as often as I can, really. I mean, something that comes out in the book, uh, characters say, you know, that the forest, it kind of gets a bit of a hold on you, doesn't it? And, you know, you're something that's gone away, but obviously you come back. I mean, is that something you would go along with? Yeah, absolutely. And I, again, it's one of those things I assumed that everybody felt about that, like that, about where they grew up until I moved away and realised that very often people don't feel like that about their homeland. And so uh, coming up next, you have got another book that you're writing, aren't you? Because it's a two-book deal. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I'm being coy, but because it's basically, you know, it's kind of like I've bashed it with a hammer and it's all over the floor at the moment and I've got to work out how it's all fitting together. But So it's still back in the forest, um, but it's contemporary or contemporary-ish this time. I think at this stage, I haven't got any dates in it. And at some point, someone's going to say to me, nail it down. You know, what's going on here? And it's about um, two women, um, one who grew up, well, both of whom grew up here and one who stayed and one who left and has come back. And they're sort of forced through circumstance to end up living, um, sharing a house together and sort of what happens to them and, you know, what it's like to come back when you've been away for a while. It's obviously just wishful for them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you feel there are still more stories set in the forest or different periods of time that you'd like to tell? Yeah, I mean, I hope that if I'm, you know, if I don't cock it up completely and I'm allowed to keep writing as it were, that I think I would always want to write about here because there are so many different uh, sort of facets of the forest you can look at or, you know, how it affects life. And it's something that, like I said, sort of came too late, this idea that it wasn't how everybody else grew up. And so there's lots about it that makes it worth talking about. I mean, the characters of, of, uh, of Seppe and Connie, I mean, they, they really sort of live with you as, as you're reading the book. I mean, obviously you lived with them for, for a very long <laughs> time, didn't long. you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it is, you know, it's that thing, like, I absolutely don't believe that sort of nonsense of, oh, I just sit here and the characters write stories for me. It's like, it's much harder work than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> I, well, they're not taking credit for anything. <laughs> but you do, I think, you know, by about the 14th rewrite, I kind of had a sense of how they sounded. But just in terms of you've got, you know, you've got a kind of... <sighs> A basket of vocabulary that you're going to use with that person and Amos can use on I mean I had loads and loads of forest dialect in it that my editor took out and she's like nobody will understand this book and I was like that's the point um, and in fact my literary agent just last week read the first version of the new book and she said Sarah so, and I said I didn't put in any old buts and she said no but there's still plenty of dialect words that I hadn't even noticed were there so. But that's part of, of the, the identity of the forest, though, isn't it? I've done projects in the past on oral history and on, on dialect, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that makes the Forest of Dean unique. And, and I, I agree. But I agree, which should be all written <laughs> in dialect. And you were saying to me that you, even now, if you're someone, you, you can distinctly recognise the Forest of Dean accent. If yeah, and my husband thinks I'm slightly mental. Like, you know, I was saying to Joe earlier, I was in a coffee shop um, in quite rural Oxfordshire, and somebody walked past and I said to my husband that was a forest accent and then I think the bit that he was really appalled by um, my poor husband was that and I tracked the guy down and said excuse me where are you from and he said Gloucestershire and I was like yes yes you know and we narrowed it down and it turned out you know he'd been at school with my cousins and all the rest of it and it's just sort of, yeah well exactly that kind of instinct that comes from it and yeah my husband had said are you sure it's not just a Gloucestershire accent and I was like no <laughs> And you talked about your family. You mentioned your grandmother, who you showed us the, the rings earlier on. She also went into service, didn't she? A little bit like Winifred Foley, who's also That's featured right. in Reading the Forest. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, from here, unless you were landed gently, which most of us wouldn't have been, you know, it was a really common um, route to, to employment. And she was the eldest, she was the eldest daughter, if not the eldest completely, in a large family. So it was just sort of expected, age 14, she went off to Birmingham for a few years. And did she talk about being homesick and missing the forest? Not explicitly, but she kept notebooks of, um, I think they're called commonplace books, you know, so like literally sort of little leather bound notebooks, and she used to write in those, and, and it's all dated, and they came to me. She was great, you know, she gave those to me um, probably when I was in my late teens, early 20s. She's like, you'll be the person who writes in them. And, um, and they were all dated from, you know, right back from when she was in service. And, you know, it's quite moving to think there she was away from home when she was writing these things down. So I think at some level she was certainly reflective, if not sort of overtly homesick. And were you somebody yourself that would keep notes, would keep journals when you were growing up before you turned to writing yourself? Tortured teenage diaries. And then <laughs> I kind of hate my, in my 30s, my mother kind of was like, would you please get this stuff out of our house? <laughs> um, and I just threw it all away. And now I'm like, oh, I would love to read what my anguished 14 year old self was doing. <laughs> <laughs> But I just it's a lot. So I mean, shelter is the title of the book, and um, shelter is a really good name because the, the Forest of Dean provides shelter, doesn't it, for a number of the characters in the book in in different kinds of ways. Yeah, exactly. And I, I sort of wanted to get at the idea that you know it's sort of a metaphorical sort of shelter. In some cases, you know, somebody builds a a hut in the woods, so it's a literal shelter, and then the the forest itself as being sort of sort of heavily deforested um, in the war because the need for timber was so much greater and those trees in some sort of in the latter parts of the war then they were being used to um, rehabilitate places that had been bombed out so you know in some respects they're providing shelter in other areas of the country. And the sense of belonging and family I think is something that comes out very much in the book because both, both of the main characters they're very far away from home but they don't really have families and homes to go back to do they and, and they become they, they grow to just, you know, love being here and being, being part of the forest. Yeah, I sort of wanted to explore that idea that, you know, you can have... So you hear sometimes about urban families, and I was like, I don't think that's just an urban thing. You know, I think any tight-knit community will enable you to find, you know, a family structure, because it's sort of something that we all crave, really, at the end of the day, probably. And there's a bit where there, there's Christmas in the book and you, you know, you really kind of feel like you're being welcomed into that home, <laughs> don't you? And we, I, I felt that when I was reading it, that you're being welcomed in just like Seppi and, and, and Connie are for that kind of first Christmas that they're, they're away from, you know, their, their normal surroundings. Mm. That was quite good fun for research because I thought, well, what did a Christmas, you know, a wartime Christmas look like? And, you know, how did you make decorations? And so I kind of <laughs> spent a few happy hours looking up how to make, you know 
baubles from pine cones. <laughs> Completely useless information. <laughs> and they brought the trees in, didn't they? There's they did. Kind of Frank says, it's okay, we'll put it back again. And I can't remember whether I just made that up or whether I read it somewhere. I'm waiting for someone to call me out on that, like the Forestry Commission to go, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you encourage people to dig up their Christmas trees. When I lived in the States, we lived um, in Seattle, um, so out in the, in the Pacific Northwest, and one year we did go with friends. You had to get a permit, but we did go and chop down our own trees in the snow. It was sort of awesome, so I was like, well, I had to put it down. I was going to say, does anywhere else in the world compare to the forest? Anywhere that no. you've been? No, there's not really. I mean, that sounds really mawkish. Um, and I, you know, I've lived in all sorts of really beautiful. Say, we lived in a little fishing village just outside Dublin for a few years, and we lived on the edge of a lake in Seattle. And and the Pacific Northwest is gorgeous, but it's sort of majestic. So it's a different scale of forest. Um, but yeah, there's something about the forest that sort of tugs you back in. I think. Mm. As this is your debut novel, how did it feel when you were first in print, when you first kind of got this in your hands and thought, this is my book? So I'm going to sound completely bonkers, but when it first came out, I mean, when it first came, arrived, actually, the postman rang the bell, and I know the postman quite well because, I, you know, I work from home a lot, um, and he and I both need to talk to people. And I said, oh, oh, that's my book, and I made him stand there while I opened it <laughs> and take a picture with me in the books, poor guy. <laughs> but then I found that I couldn't be in the same room as him. It just felt really weird. I was like, oh, you know, it felt sort of overwhelming somehow. It came out last July and now I'm all right, but it did. So I've got a shelf, we've got a room where we keep all our books and um, there's a shelf on there that I call my friends and family shelf and, you know, people that I know who've written books are on that shelf. And so my husband and the kids were like, oh, we need to put your, and I said, no, I use this room too much and it's only recently been all right to have my book on the front. I mean, partly that just feels screamingly narcissistic. Look, I'm on my own bookshelf. <laughs> you should have it on your own bookshelf, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I interview quite a lot of author, authors and they'll often say to me that um, meeting other authors is, is fantastic because you do work in isolation a lot, don't you? Yeah, you do. I mean, I've been really lucky and met quite, uh, because I run a short story night up in Oxford and um, I teach publishing up at Oxford Brits as well. So I've met a lot of book people over the years and yeah, it is really nice to, and also to have someone to whom you can sort of gently whinge without wanting, you know, so when I hadn't had a book published, I would have just hated anybody who told me it was, you know, hard work or overwhelming, right? I would have just been mm. like, all right <laughs> <laughs> for you to say sort of thing. <laughs> and so to have, you know, and lots of people sort of sat me down and said, don't read the Goodreads reviews, don't, you know, there's always going to be a nutter, don't, you know, don't do this, that and the other, and that was like any job I suppose like it's just nice to have colleagues mm. I know you're going to be talking later on about writing book reviews I mean if anybody in the, in the audience is, is thinking oh, I wouldn't mind trying my hand at writing and getting a book out there how easy or difficult is it at the moment to do that I always reckon if I can do it anyone can do it you know it's sort of like this is if, if I could it was just I was quite stubborn you know like there were plenty of times when it would made a lot more sense to give up I think um, but I just knew that I really and because I really believed in the end in the story that I thought, you know, that I wanted out there and I thought that I couldn't give up on it from that perspective either. But yeah, I'd say go for it. Mm. You know. We know you've got another book that will be coming out next year. Do you kind of think beyond that or is it sort of very much one book at a time? Only in the sense, and now I'm at the kind of hard bit with the second book because I've written the first draft and now I've got to take it all apart and accept that none of it's working and go back over it and and it seems that I, I'm not capable of writing perfect prose like that so I have to kind of you know burn the house down and start again and so right now I'm very fondly thinking about how the next book would be even better and I've kind of got ideas percolating but I think that's just sort of you know delusion it's because <laughs> It's because I'm facing a really kind of hard climb on this one right now. And so it's much more interesting to think about the kind of fun beginnings of something else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't hold very many. Sometimes I, people ask me to write short stories for various things and I can do that and hold that in my head at the same time. But I don't think I'm capable of holding 200,000 words in my head at the same time. <laughs> That's a lot of words. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sarah, it's been lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm now going to open it up to any questions the audience have any. Hello. How many words is in your book? 104,000. I got to 78,000. Well, you're there. You only so need 80,000. I have to get more done. No, no, you don't. This is too big. Do you know what? The next one, it's going to be have at least not that much. Because who wants to read a book this big? 
you know. <laughs> I, sold, <laughs> I sold it at 70,000 words, that's when the publisher Well, I was told it's a novella if I did 54,000, because I've done quite a few on Kindle, and I've, do, I've done plays, and talking about the Fire Star, like my one play's got that in it. Awesome. I'm not frightened of it. Good. I put the old button, I put the Zick, and my company is Zick Forester's Way. Right? <laughs> with a little girl hanging upside down in the tree. Brilliant. Because that's me. And she took it from a picture of me. Oh. So that's on Facebook. But I've been now, I was then asked to do 65 to 75. It makes it a novel. That's right. So I'm 78,000, I'm still going on. Well, yeah, but you're, if you want to stop, you're there. My agent says 70,000 oh, no, words. To say. Oh, really? <laughs> 70,000 words is apparently <laughs> the right amount for mm. if you want to sell it overseas because every book that's translated into another language becomes bigger because English requires fewer words. So she's delighted by 70,000 words and this sort of book is a nightmare for her because, mm. you know, if the Italians wanted it, it would be 150,000 words and then they don't want, you know, that's, no one wants to print that yeah. much. I could so. see my going to that actually before because I've got people interested in it. And they told me to do that amount up to seventy-eight thousand. I'm gone seventy-eight thousand now. I'm going on and on and on. What you're saying? <laughs> well, you might. Well, I mean, this was about. I think I wrote two hundred and fifty thousand words to get down to <laughs> the right hundred. I might cut it later and yeah. tidy it. So, so. I mean, you said that you did quite a lot of editing of it, Sarah. I mean, how much does the editor then come in and edit what you've written? Mm. So I edited it. I worked with someone who did a lot of editing it. on I'm it. I'm getting my I worked. We, I had this novel swap with a friend and then my agent and I worked on it for about three months and then my editor probably did another three months work on it and she, I say it was 70,000 words when she bought it mm. and we knew that we needed to do some more work on the end and that ended up being another 40,000 words which I think surprised us both. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, I have a question, not about the technical process, I might pick your brains about that later. <laughs> so, um, Please do. But you talked about um, acknowledging readers from the forest and saying, you know, apologies, etc. But what's been the reaction to the book from people outside the forest? Have they sort of commented on their perceptions of the forest? Are you one of the reasons we're getting all these damn tourists here? Probably. <laughs> I hope so. People do often say, oh, I really want to go there now, which is really touching. I went to Doncaster and did an event at the Waterstones there and you know, people were like, I have to put it on my list of places because, you know, it's, it's so far from there. And I'm like, yes. you've got your own woods. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Not like um, No, well, exactly. I think, you know, it, people are... And it makes me really happy when that happens. They're as intrigued by the place mm. as they are. Like, often they want to know what happens with the characters, but just as often they want to know if they can really go and see it. And that's why it matters to me to use the real names for places. And, yes. Yes, yeah. I know when I have my Australian visitors, you know, come over and they're just sort of like totally overwhelmed. Not at this time of year when it's all mud and trees. <laughs> <No. laughs> shot down by certain people, but <laughs> but yeah, and uh, it is it is indeed a lovely place. Well, the seasons really come out in the book. That was one thing I was going to say. Is you, you oh, go God, through so all much the work on that as well. seasons. Well, and, like, and I, I did. I put the bluebells in January, by or you know, had left them in and, and changed. <laughs> so that had to get changed out. And there was something about some particular bird that was in the wrong thing. But for the most part, yeah. I mean, the season it really mattered, and it mattered to my editor as well. So she'd kind of make me go back and go, "Are you sure about the bluebells?" And I was like, "Yeah, you know, virtually with an almanac." <laughs> Show that that was right. If anybody's going to say anything else, I'm in it. I was going to oh. say. Yeah, I was just going to ask: is there is there a is there a section you could read us? A short short piece you could read us? If you, can I yeah. if you feel like doing it, but I don't mind. Let me see if I can find a forest bit. Although I'm not, I did want somewhere else say. Um, Anybody here from the Forest of Dean? This was in London, and I was like, clearly the answer to that is no, and then I can do my bad forest accent. <laughs> and <laughs> someone was from the... Here. Well, no, it's here, yeah, but someone was from the Plods, and I was like, OK. Oh, but wow. I did it anyway, and then and she was very flattering about me mashing up the accent. Let's find a bit where... OK, this is the bit where... So this is Seppe, the prisoner of war. It's quite near the beginning, and he is just arriving. Do you just want a couple of minutes? Yeah, Maybe. that'd be great, yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just... The truck veered abruptly right and jolted along a rough path. Was this the end? Seppe pulled his greatcoat tighter, but the chill of dread wreathed him still. The fear his father had beaten into him had only become more piercing during these months of battle marching endless miles while the flies buzzed around his head in bitter halos. 
and now he was a prisoner of the Allies and about to be made to pay for the sins he'd been compelled to commit. The juddering of the truck slowed and Seppe looked out through the gap at the back of the tarpauling. It was all greens and browns, swaying. Or was the truck swaying? He blinked through the fog in his brain. They were at the heart of an avenue of interlocking oaks. Tentative green buds reached for each other. He inched aside the tarpaulin, heavy and cold, and peered out. Trees mazed together, trunks twisted and bent towards invisible hope. English trees. Oaks, but beeches too, and spiky-fingered yew. Tasso filling his nostrils. You were supposed to heal. Oi, mister, what are you doing in there then? The English, the enemy. He hadn't understood what they'd said, but it couldn't be good. They wouldn't know he didn't believe in the course he'd been made to fight for. They'd only want to harm him. Besides Seppe, his compatriots sh shifted dopely on the bench as the unfamiliar language met their ears too. Deaf as a post, this one is. A stick flew up and Seppe flinched. It missed him by inches and he picked it up, turning it in his hands, wondering. The bark was pliable, rough against his palm. He looked down at the two boys loping alongside the truck. They were only youngsters, maybe 11 or 12. The one nearest the truck pulled a face at him, not quite hatred, but certainly antipathy. POWs, aren't you? The baddies! Seen that Mr. Hitler out there? The boy goose-stepped across to his friend, who grabbed the side of the truck and hopped onto the running board. He was much too close. The only thing Seppe could do was squirm out of his way. The British surely had no love lost for the Italians, not even now they'd been downgraded to co-belligerents. Look at him, all scaredy! No wonder them to get themselves caught! The boy swung in, his leering face too close. Seppe turned away. Couldn't show a kid that he was intimidated. Won't be able to escape from us though, not in our forest. Goes on for miles and miles. No way out for you, prisoner. Thank you ever so much, Sarah. Thank you, Joe. That was Thank really, you, really fascinating. I really, I, well, it was really, really, really interesting. Um, can we put hands together for Joe and Sarah? Thank you very, very much.